you're Cindy, I don't want you to yell at me. And 10 gals, if that's whatever the combination is. Because I know I've been up there on the roof with Cindy. She'll tear off the roof now, okay? So we need 10 names that are going to commit to this coming Saturday. At, look, it's not 5.25 in the morning. We'll let you sleep in. You, you don't have to be there till 8. But you get to sleep in, right? I put the address down right here, too, so you can put it in your trusty little smartphone, and you can get out there and help. Listen, if these two names right here are Moses and Kyle, I know where you all live. And I'll send Paul to your house. Pretty good. I'll have donuts. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. So I'm going to start right here. Okay. Because you're the closest guy right there. And if you would consider being kind and generous, because that's what Christians are kind and generous. And they want to help their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. So if you could please help out with that, that would be awesome. Okay. Let's move on. Um, you guys, are gonna, the next announcement, you're going to go, yay. Okay. We're not taking an offering tonight. But, that doesn't mean we're not taking an offering. Because we have a lot going on, we're not going to pass the plates around. But we do have a box up by the door. We have a box behind, you know, in the hallway over here by the giving machine. So you can give there, please. We want to keep, uh, keep getting open here. Uh, last week, I introduced you to our new friend over in Uganda. Little Angel. Remember Angel? You all remember her picture? Okay. Um, I told you we're going to have a sign-up sheet for you this week so we could sponsor her. We want to assist her. Uh, but what Compassion International does, they send out an information sheet, much like the one on the, on the wall about Holy, and it'll tell you a lot about her and her living conditions and all that. So what I've done is I've chosen to just hold off on the sign-up sheet because this coming week we should get that information sheet with her picture and all that info. And so that way you can get, find out a lot more about her before you commit your $38 to her well-being. So we'll look for that for next week. Um, Kyle mentioned a moment ago about the men's group and what in, impact it's had on, on Jimmy's life. And I have to tell you, honestly, it's had an impact on a lot of our lives. I know it's been great for me. I can really, if you want to bless your wife, guys, you want to bless your wife? Yeah. One guy. One. Who wants to bless their wife? Yeah! Woo! <laughs>
talk about the resurrection, Lord, I thank you once again for the amazing, crazy, insane love that is the cross of Calvary. I thank you, Lord, when I see when the Spirit of God impacts somebody's life. And it changes them. And as I scan the crowd mentally now, the people that are in this room, right down to our brother Jimmy, who just was obedient to your call to be baptized. And I think of all the changing that you've done in the hearts of the people that are here. I'm not going to be shy, but I think about my brother Paul, his wife Hope. I think about my brother Mark, Kyle, my wife, Jerry. There's changes in them, and I've seen it. I've seen you work in the lives of people that are here. And it's so awesome to celebrate a living God. God that's still around, it's just as strong today as he was in the time gone by when we studied the wonderful things that you did. Lord, it's so awesome to see the wonderful things that you're doing. And I just rejoice in them. Lord, I ask that you would continue to do that. Lord, I pray that today we would celebrate the fact that you're not in the grave anymore. That you're alive. That's who we serve, Lord. We serve a risen king. We serve you, Jesus, because you're alive and well and strong. And, you, and, and you're worthy of all of our adoration. You're worthy of our entire life. Lord, you're capable of taking care of every single need in the hearts of every single person on this earth. Lord, I pray that tonight through the study of your word, that we would have a deeper understanding and appreciation for that truth. That you are strong. Your spirit is able. And that it lives in us. And that it can, it can change us. It can, it can fix us. It can, it can enlighten us. It can lift us up when we're hurting and, and weak. That's who you are, Lord. That's the God of the universe. That's Jesus. And that's who we worship here tonight. Lord, I pray that you'll bless every person that's here tonight with, a, with an amazing experience with you. Bless our time with you, Father. I just don't even feel like this stop, but I just want to keep praying all night, Lord. smartest guy in the world, so I'm just saying this. Tune in our receiver to hear you now. Tune us in for your voice. Jesus name. Amen. Amen. You all know, want to think that I'm crazy.
this is a guy, St. Nick, that, you know, every year he monitors every child on earth. I think that's a violation of our rights somehow. Yeah. I'm not sure. And he monitors, you know, whether you're good or bad. And then he, uh, uh, just before Christmas, he, he, you know, Mrs. Claus pumps him up. And, and he puts on a little red suit and, and a red cap, and he grows his beard up. Just <laughs> for the seat. Talk about um, evidence for something. 
I'd say that if you, uh, if you're, if it happens and then you can report it soon, that adds credibility to it, right? If I said something or I did something and several hundred years later someone told the story about it for the first time, like I start a story with Robert, he'd tell it to the chairman. By the time we got back here, in this one room in 15 minutes, it'd be trashed, right? So if it happens a great deal uh, uh, far away, time-wise, it's kind of could ruin it. But if it happens, and then boom, you get an eyewitness account on the, on the 6 o'clock news, that has a little credibility. Would you agree? Would you agree? Yeah. Okay. So that's one thing. Um, the Christian book says that it's real. No good. That's easy, right? But what about if your opponent says it's real? What if, what if like, I pick on Mark a lot because of the bills, right? I love him, but, like, he's going to tell, well, he might not even tell you that the bills were good, but... But he may, right? He might say, well, the bills are good. Because that's his team, right? That makes sense that he would say that. It would be stupid. But that's beside the point, right? We can say that the Patriots are good. Okay, so let's just forget that. Let's just say that Paul said the Patriots were good. We could, we could agree. I'm like, I can agree. I'm a Patriots fan. Right? But, 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 but if a Buffalo Bills fan says the Patriots are good... That can add a little credibility to it because he really shouldn't say that. Does that make any sense at all? Yes. Okay. Hold that thought a second. You all know who Plato is? Yes. You all heard of Plato, the ancient Greek philosopher? Plato, he died in 347 BC. Okay? Before Christ, like way back here. Okay? The oldest surviving transcript from him is from 895 A.D. Now that's 1,200 years of separation. Does anyone doubt the existence of Plato and his teachings? Two people. Okay? Our, okay, let me ask you this. Does our school system and our colleges agree that they exist, that he exists and teach their stuff, his stuff? Yes. No problem. 1,200 years. Anyone ever hear of Aristotle? Yeah. Okay. Ancient Greek philosopher. He makes poetry. He does. <laughs> the Greek philosopher Aristotle died in three. Uh, he died in 322 BC, and the oldest surviving manuscript from him is from 1100 AD. That's 14. Hundred years of separation, yet our world believes that he is real and his teachings are real. The problems. Let me just give you a little tidbit. Now I know that this is our hope, so it's no big deal. The Gospel of John, they have transcripts from the Gospel of John that were written within a hundred years of Jesus' death. Yet, People say, eh, that's not real. Because it's not the opponent, it's the proponent, right? <laughs> if our enemy could say it was real, that would help, wouldn't it? Yeah. Who are the people that told Rome to kill Jesus? What, na what nation was that? Jews. Jewish people. Jews. You guys ever hear of Flavius Josephus? Yeah. Yes. He was an ancient Jewish historian. The Jews had no reason to believe that Jesus was real. But in 93 AD, less than 100 years after Jesus passes on, does his thing, he writes a piece that we now call the Antiquities of the Jews. It's broken up into books. And in book 18, which is commonly known as the Testimonium Flavianum, he writes this. About this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man. For he wrote surprising feats. I wrought, I'm sorry, I'm not I thought that was smart. I wrought surprising feats. He was the Christ. You know what that means? 
He's saying he was the Messiah. This is a Jewish guy. He was the Messiah. When Pilate condemned him to be crucified, those who had come to love him did not give up their affection for him. On the third day, he appeared restored to life. And the tribe of Christians has not disappeared. This is the opponent saying that the resurrection is true. That's massive credibility. Massive credibility. But it pales in comparison to something else. It pales in comparison to something else. Let me share with you what that something else is. Peter and John, you guys heard of Peter and John, haven't you? Peter and John, over in the book of Acts, they're preaching Jesus to people. They're telling people that, that Jesus was the Christ and that no other name in heaven is given to be saved and you killed them and this and that. And the authorities, they're saying, listen, you can't do this anymore. You, really what it was, you're usurping authority from us. We're losing control here. And so you need to stop, right? And so, so they say, you need to stop. But, but here's the thing. They didn't. They didn't stop. Now you gotta understand something. This is what you, this is what Peter and John said. In Acts chapter 4, verse 19, Peter and John replied, Do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. We we can't stop telling what we've seen and heard. But you've got to take a second to think about this. What they've seen and heard. Well, yeah, they've seen the miracles of Jesus, right? They, they've seen him walk on water. <laughs> they've seen him take the, 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 the loaves of bread and a couple of fish and multiply it for thousands. They, they've seen him uh, take lepers and touch them and heal them. They've seen him take paralyzed guys and, and heal them. They've seen him cast out demons from people. I mean, they've seen all this stuff. And so they're enthused about this Jesus, as we all would be. But what they had also seen is that he was arrested, that he was whipped, and he was beaten, and he was stretched, and he was pierced, and he was stabbed, and he was killed. Yet, they still wouldn't stop. Why? Because of something else. Because of something else. Do me a favor and go to the book of John. John 21, right at the end of the Gospel of John. See, they had seen him whipped and beaten. And they had seen him killed. He's dead. They had, they, had, they, had, they had confidence in this guy. It was like, yes, the king is here. So we're going to be delivered. No more oppression from the Roman government. We're going to be a nation. We're going to be free. And we've got a king that we can follow. And then all of a sudden, he's dead. So what happens? John chapter 1, the guys that were fishermen, they said, well, that's a nice run. It's a good run, Jesus. You did some cool stuff. We certainly had a great time with the show. But now you're dead. Game over. Well, I guess we'll just go fishing again. We'll just go fishing. So they're going to go fishing. But see, what happened was, while they're out fishing, <laughs> someone shows up. And it was Jesus. He says, throw out your net, verse 6. Throw out your net on the right side of the boat, and you'll get some fish. So they did. They couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. Then the disciple Jesus loved, John, said to Peter, It's the Lord. He was dead. And now he's not. He rose from the dead. Tough guys were a sandwich. 
Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, for he had stripped for work. Now that I don't understand. So the guy's naked. You know, he's got issues. <laughs> really, I don't even like, like, who has a job here? Who got naked for you? I mean, oh. <laughs> I forgot Josh was in the room. I have to behave myself. Listen, when they got there, they found breakfast waiting. So Jesus had cooked breakfast for them, told them to bring some of the fish. It was the Lord. It was the Lord. And so at the very end of this section of scripture, it's that famous scene when he says to Peter, okay, now I'm alive, you see me, here I am, and I fed you, and I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm not dead anymore. Okay? I'm not dead. And so this is what I want you to, Peter, do you love me? Yeah, I do. Feed my sheep, you love me. Feed my sheep, you love me. Feed my sheep. What is that? What, is, what, what does it mean to feed? What does it mean? Does that mean that, that he is supposed to be the cook? Jesus cooked. So should Peter be the cook for all Christians worldwide? Should he have dinner right here for you right now? How? What does it mean? What does he mean, Peter, feed my sheep? It means care for my people so they can live in abundance. John 10, 10. I came that you might have life now in abundance. In abundance. So today's goal, this is what I want to do with you. I want to change the someday thinking that you have. I don't want you to be thinking about someday. That, that Jesus went to the cross to pay for your sin so that someday when you get to heaven, it's not going to live in hell right now. This place is horrible, but someday we're going to be in heaven where there's no more tears and no more pain and no more sickness and disease, no more strife, no more problems, no more arguing, no more nothing bad. Like someday it's going to be there. And I want to get that mindset out of you because that's not the truth of God's word, okay? That's not the truth of God's word. Now, I may have been, um, I don't know, I may have been one of the people that misguided you a little bit. When I baptize people here, I always say the same thing, and it's found in Colossians 2.12. In Colossians 2.12, it says this, I now bury you with Christ, and like him, you'll be raised to new life. You'll be raised to new life because you trusted in the mighty power of God that raised Christ from the dead. to, what does it mean that I now bury you with Christ? 
Christ, and like him, you'll be raised to new life. Okay? This is what it says. Now, um, immediately here in Romans chapter 6, Paul is answering this foolish question that people have about, okay, so uh, if I'm saved and God forgives me of my sin, then maybe if I sin more, people are always looking for a hook. You know what I'm saying? It's stupid. They want to see, like, how to work the system. So, so, so like, okay, so if you forgive sin, so if I, if I sin more, more glory to God, right? What is that? Stupidity. Stupid. 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 Okay? And so Paul answers that. Well, then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? And then with an exclamation point, of course not. Okay? So it's very, very clear. But that's not what we're studying here tonight. But that's a good point. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with, with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism, and just as Christ was raised from the dead... <laughs> Amen. <laughs> By the glorious power of the Father, now also, I think I messed this up. Now we also may live new lives. Hey guys, what's up? Since we have been united with Him in His death, we will also be raised to life as He was. <laughs> so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. Yeah. That's a good one, guys. That's progress right there. You, yeah. you, you're learning. That was good. That was good. That was good. That was good. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. We are sure of this, because Christ was raised and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive through God. To God through Christ Jesus. Now, it's very appropriate that we had a baptism tonight, and we didn't plan, we didn't know anything I was going to be talking about, but I'm glad that he got baptized today, and never, ever, ever doubt that God is in control, because this is perfect, okay? Couldn't have been scripted any better. What Jimmy needs to totally wrap his brain around somehow, and it's difficult. I mean, let's just be honest. We all, you know, it's easy. You know, Christianity, we're saved. It's all good. You know. But he needs to understand that everyone who's been baptized is that this, what I just read with you, that is truth. It, like, we don't feel like sin has no power all the time. But the truth is, is that it doesn't. That when he went in that one, when, when Kyle pulled out the shovel and dug the hole for him just now and put him in this grave, that Jimmy, what he was when he walked in tonight, that man, literally, is dead. You, you get this. And then when he came up out of the water, he is a new creation. That it's a different person now. And so that everything that I just read to you is true to him. Raise your hand if you've been baptized. You too. You too. And you have to understand this. You have to understand that when you when you were baptized, you were dead, just like Jesus was dead in the grave. And because of that, sin has lost its power over you. You no longer have a master by the name of sin. You have a new master. And his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. And you don't have to say yes to sin anymore. It's like, I'm going to say something that may offend some of you. But it's true. If this is true. Based on what this says, this is true. It is easy to say no to sin. You can't tell me, based on the truth of God's word, that it's hard to put the ball down. Because it says right here that sin has lost its 
drink like a fish. And I smoke like a chimney. And one day I asked him to stop it for me. And I haven't had a cigarette or a drink in like 13 years. Amen. Like it's not that hard. I am a wretched human being. I have no self-control. But he just took it away. Like the, the power is there. You just need to say no. It's that easy. We complicate it somehow. And I don't know why. Now, why is it so easy to say no? Well, why is it so easy to say yes to Jesus? Because that's the big thing. That's what we should be focusing on. That might say no to sin. That's ugly. Let's talk about why we should say yes. If you just jump over to Romans chapter 8, let's see some more clarity. Romans chapter 8, just two verses here. 10 and 11. You there? All right. And Christ lives within you. I want to stop there. I've been a Christian now for a while. I know that that's true. Y'all know that that's true? Like, when you get saved, the Holy Spirit lives in you, the Spirit of Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit is. The Spirit of Christ is in you. You know that, right? How many times have you said or heard somebody say that in your life? Like a million times, right? So after a while, it's just repetitive, repetitive, repetitive. It almost loses its luster sometimes. You know, I mean, like, I, who, if you, like, I know this is probably not true for Paul, but, like, is, whose who's favorite food is pizza? Now, honestly, honestly, well, let's, let's just go further, okay? All of us have a favorite food, right? Think, think of your favorite food, okay? Okay, if you ate that food every single day, Right? So if you, yeah, so if you hear the fact that Jesus Christ lives in you every single day, after a while it just becomes kind of, and it's not that it is old news, it's amazing news, but after a while it just kind of loses its luster. I mean, you guys, you know what I'm saying? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not picking on Jesus here, I'm just saying that it just kind of loses its luster after a while. And we, that's why we need to revisit this all the time. Like this. Because it's true. And we need to remind ourselves of that. So yeah, let's just go on. It says, and Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin. Now let me just say that it's not necessarily your sin that's going to make you die. It's the fact that Adam and Eve sin. And because of their sin, it brings death to all people. So we can blame them. Now we're active participants in this here this time. But that's what started this whole downward spiral. So we'll blame I'm going to literally probably punch you out when I get there. Um, so, he should have been watching this woman. He should have been watching this woman. Right? Right? Come on now. She, 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 she took the fruit, and Adam was right there the whole time, it says. Was he leading? He should have been watching his woman. Right. I just want to clarify. Amen, brother, right? Yeah, yeah. Colossians 
1, 21, 22, it says this. In the present tense, because of what Christ did on the cross, he has reconciled you to the Father, and as you are brought into his presence, now you are holy, not you're going to be holy. You are holy, you are blameless, and you are without single fault as you stand before him. When? Now. now. Right now. Now what does this mean? What does this mean? It means we've been set free from the power of sin. That means as we stand, or in your case, sit now, addictions are broken when? Now. now. Your addiction, if you have one, is already broken. Do you understand that? See, that's the thing we can't wrap our mind around because we haven't chosen to put that thing down. The addiction has already been broken. Your attitude has already been changed. And your attempt to do something great with your life that you felt like you couldn't, it's encouraged big time because the Spirit of God that raised Christ from the dead lives in you now. Do you understand? You missed that one. Right? That's the truth of it. True love is available. True joy is possible. Now this, you have to understand, this is the real world. You know what really tweaks me? I don't know if it tweaks you. But what tweaks me is when people have talks about uh, religion and spiritual things. And I'm not, you know, not everybody's Christian, so you know, whatever. But we're Christians. So we talk about things out of God. We talk about the Bible and this and that. And then during this conversation, tell me this tweaks you. When someone says, yeah, this, but you know, back here in the real, real world, we do the and they start going on. I'm like, man, that's just so wrong. You see, this right here, oh, sorry, that's the real yeah. world. Do you understand that this, this world that we live in out there, like that's like a facade. This, what you read, that is the real world. Yeah. That's the world you need to live in. You can't, you can't, uh, you can't cower to the pressures of that. You need to cower to the pressures of this. Like this is the real world. And some people would say, well, it's not it's like the supernatural. The supernatural world is the real world. That's the world that we live in, but we don't actually believe that it is. And I want you to wrap your mind around that. That that is. The real world. Colossians 2.13 kind of dovetails what we're talking about. About Jesus Christ living in you and giving you life into your mortal bodies. Before you were saved, before you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you know you were dead. I mean you were existing, you were breathing. says that we were dead in our sins. But what I just share with you just now is that now in your mortal body you have life. You have life. Here's the key. Here's the key. And listen, this sounds so easy that it almost sounds like eh, most of you know. It's almost so easy that you just want to throw it away. But I don't know where, 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 where the things of God got so complicated. I don't know where that came from. But it's really not. The things of God are easy. In Deuteronomy 30, 19, it says this. God says this to his people. Today, I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. And then God 
And I don't even understand. I can't fathom why he would say this because he's God and we're just little ants. He says, Oh, look at that human cheese bag. It's almost like you can just feel his heart breaking because so many people choose that. You all know that. Some of them are in this room. Some of them are you. And God's like, oh, look at you. And some of us do. I can't introduce you to her because I don't know her name. But the other day I was at Hobby Lobby and I was buying some t shirts for our, our revolution t shirts. Walking in. I met this, this older lady. She was packing up her truck. She had her granddaughter, granddaughter's <coughs> friend, in there with her. Um, and uh, I was trying to load that ottoman that's here in the lounge into my car. It was kind of a small, you know, little car. And her truck was kind of close, and her truck was blue, and my car's white, and I didn't want to put a white dent in the, you know, in her car. And, so they were kind and courteous, and they waited as I, and I said, you know, ma'am, I just, you know, I don't want to, why don't we just let you get in, and, and, and I'll wait. Well, I'm just trying to get somebody in church, to be honest with you, all the time, because I'm crazy, right? So somehow I'm going to segue this into, so I'm like, well, I just bought this thing for the lounge in our church. So that she might say, oh, where are you going to church? You know, just wait. As soon as I said that, she went from this to, you know, you know the move from smokers, right? right? I used to do that. It's just, it's a quick one. It's a transition. Right? I'm like, damn, I don't really care if you smoke. Like, we have an ashtray out the side of our door at the church. I really don't care if you smoke. So we're sitting there talking. She's telling me about a granddaughter, a little thing, who loves the Lord, and da, 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 you know, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Of course, the cigarette comes up. I don't, I don't really give a rip that she smokes. I mean, I don't care. <laughs> And, and, and so she's like, oh, and I'm going to quit this one day. <laughs> like she has to try to like, you know, you know what I mean? Like, because I told her who I was and, you know, I'm just a guy. This is just my job. You know this, right? We're all on equal ground here. But to some people, you know, oh, good. Don't smoke. You might do that. Like, you guys know, right? Crazy, right? So she's like, well, one day, one of these days, I'm gonna, I'm gonna quit this. You know, I've been, I've been asking. I'm like, well, man, why don't you just quit right now? And she's like, well, you know, he's gonna, I'm like, I, I'm, you know, I'm ready for the sermon, right? I'm just hammered. You know? <laughs> I start yelling at him. I'm like, you can put that thing down right now. Right now, at the moment of conversion. 
conversion, He gave you His Holy Spirit. It dwells in you now. And that same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you now. Okay? Now, I love the Bible. One of the things I love about the Bible, this is our last one. This is our last peek into the scripture today. It's just, I love the Bible because it's just raw honesty. Right? It's raw honesty. It just, it just hits you right between the eyes, you know. I love that. I love that. Uh, go to Galatians chapter 5. I think we got that on the screen. Yeah. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. I'll give you a moment to get there. But I love the scriptures because it's just brutally honest. It's nitty gritty. It's it's just it's raw, right? It's not like oh, you should just become a Christian. Everybody's gonna be buddies. <laughs> it's not like that. Y'all live that, right? Yeah. No one's living bunnies and ponies here. Nobody. <laughs> Nobody. Maybe you did back in the. <laughs> not anymore. Put it down. Right. Galatians 5.17 tells us the honesty of this truth, uh, of this, this power that lives in us, and, and we're free to, we're, we have the power in us to make choices, okay? But here's what it says in, 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 in uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, the sinful nature wants to do evil. So you feel it too, right? You feel it. Don't you bubble up inside you? I mean, you know you want to do bad. I mean, all of us, the Apostle Paul said, I don't want to be bad, but I'm bad. Right? I mean, so we all feel it, right? And he acknowledges this here. The sinful nature wants us to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit of God wants us to do. We know that to be true. It's true. We know it's true. No surprise there. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. And this is the, the raw part. Though these two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. These are, you're not free, like it's not easy. It's not that that sin thing isn't there. It's not carved away completely when he comes up out of the water. It's still there. So there's this constant fight. So what do we have to do? You fall back on Deuteronomy, which says what? I must choose. I must choose. That's all, listen, it's nothing more than that. It's just a choice as to whether you will follow sin or whether you will follow the Spirit. And that's as simple as I can put it. The, the power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you, which gives you the ability to fight that fight against this choice for sin and choose the Spirit. It's, it's honestly that easy. It's, it's not easy, but it's that simple. You can say no to sin. Like, literally, everyone in here, right now, in this room, you all have something. I do too. And you can sit, I'm telling you, as sure as I'm standing here, this is the real world, yo. Know? This is it, right here. There's no, this is nothing fake. This is the real world. You all believe in thou shalt not steal? You believe that, right? Sometimes. Okay, yeah. Like <laughs> <laughs> you believe in thou shalt not steal. Don't lie. Don't kill. Right? Yeah. The list goes on, right? Well, listen, if you believe that, why won't you believe this? Why will you not live a life that reflects this absolute foundational truth that is just as true as creation? Why? Why? It's because it takes a lot of faith to apply that. Does it? Yeah. Or do you just choose it, young man? No, it takes, it takes a lot of faith, personally. If you believe it, that's your thing. And I'm telling you right now. Belief and like faith are different things. Listen, listen. Because belief can follow your choice. You won't see him act in your life unless you do something. You can't sit around and wait for one day he's going to make you not want to smoke anymore like that lady was doing. You know what she could do? Throw it down. Just throw it down. We can do it. But it takes faith that that will actually happen. Really? It does. It 
But it takes a coward never to try. I have tried, and I did quit cigarettes. I quit it in one day. There you go. There you go. You could have still been doing it today, couldn't you? Actually, Bob, I'm not doing it. That's brutal honesty. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Listen, make a choice. It's not that hard. See, we, we create in ourselves these illusions that it's a mountain. When, when we read God's word like we have tonight, it's a molehill. Think of it in light of the resurrection of Christ. He raised himself from the grave. And he was dead. And that same power that can raise a dead guy can also tell you to put the beer down. Does it work, Mr. Agent? Hell yeah.
Now, Lord, we've all been given this card tonight, and on the back it says, my next step. So, Lord, we, we've heard what you've done. Now I want to hear what you want to do now. So we're going to go quiet for a few moments. I have about two to three minutes before Mark leads us in communion. And I want you all to pray right now. Just, just, just you. Don't think about your husband. Don't think about your wife. Don't think about your kids. Just you. And I want you to ask the living God how you are to respond to this message tonight. That I would encourage you before you leave, before you start socializing with everybody, that you immediately go to that bookcase and you grab a pen and you write down what he wants you to do. And then I encourage you. I encourage you.